the Mystic Center, and I'm continuing to talk about how the church separated itself from the roots of the Jewish faith. Our Messiah, Jesus, came as a Jew into a Jewish world to save his own, and he came that way for a reason, and every single item that he spoke of, everything he was surrounded by was all part of his plan to show himself to the world as the one who would come, the chosen anointed Messiah. So last time we talked about how there were first separations that came because there were Jewish believers and Jewish non-believers, right? After the Lord died, rose again, and ascended into heaven. So there was a church that started of Jewish believers, and there became some separations as they ended up worshiping in different ways. Um, obviously, the ones who worshipped the Messiah became followers of the Messiah and worshipped in the Messiah, and then the other Jewish non-believers became rabbinical Judaism. So it became a a religion built on the law and built on laws so that they could please God. So it was establishing their own righteousness versus the righteousness of Messiah. So now we want to talk about, though, how, how, what was the set of event that actually allowed the Council of Nicaea in 325 to occur? The council that literally paganized the Christian religion and threw out the Jewish roots of the faith and not only threw out those roots but denounced them. So at that time we had a tree with roots and at that council they said we're going to cut ourselves off from those roots and it became a wild branch really <laughs> um, with no roots that draw deep into the water that actually would feed the the fruit give us the fruit for the tree so we're like a withered warped tree the pagan um, Christian church so let's talk about how that happened though it didn't happen overnight um, there was of course the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem and the worship did not center around Jerusalem more and more as the centuries went on first and second and third century so one of the main contributing factors was that the center of Christianity um, changed into, into the Greek worldview. So Christianity had started, or followers of Jesus had started, as a sect of, of Judaism. And they um, were all ce celebrating the feast, celebrating Passover, doing all the things they would have done raised as Jewish people, but doing it with the Lord and in the spirit of the Lord and celebrating it in his temple, in his heart, in his house, who he was. So as the Gentiles got saved and then they started taking over the church more and more, the, there was a Greek worldview that started to permeate the atmosphere and permeate the church. Um, they began to accept these Greek philosophies more than the Tanakh. And the Tanakh is the first books of the Bible, the Old Testament, the, the covenant, the Old Covenant, which we call the Old Testament, and it is called the Tanakh. So they began to adopt this Greek worldview. Well, the Greek worldview was a world that taught about the physical and material world being like bad and we live in like this other worldly state um, which enabled the church the views of the church to become less and less literal so as we we went along in this Greek worldview it became an allegorical way to read the scriptures so we're not thinking about literal Israel anymore, literal Jerusalem, literally the people of God being Israel, but the church began to call itself Israel. 
which we are part of Israel. We're grafted in branches if we're believers. But we didn't replace Israel. No way along the line did we ever replace Israel. But um, I'm just reading notes out of a, a book that I should have looked over again last night. <laughs> but um, Anyway, this these people rose up as spokesmen in the church um, as early as 100 A.D., Justin Martyr, um, he claimed that God's covenant with the Jews was no longer val valid and that and the Gentiles had replaced the Jews in God's redemptive plan. And then there was Ign Ignatius, uh, who was a bishop of the church at Antioch, and he wrote that anyone who celebrated the Passover with the Jews or received the emblems of the Jewish feast was a partaker of with those who killed the Lord and his apostles. Now, this whole thing about the Feast of Israel is really, really, really important. And we as Gentile believers, if we grew up in the paganized church, we were ripped off. And not only ripped off, we've been deceived. And we will be under judgment of the Lord if we don't read the word for ourselves and understand what it means to celebrate the Feast of the Lord, which is himself. It's a manifold wisdom of God. It's, it's more pictures of himself. So we're actually saying we don't want to know more of the Lord if we don't want to understand the Feast of Israel. And it's not a light thing. It's a very heavy thing. And in Zechariah 14, uh, 16 through 19, it's about the restored... Um, heaven and earth it's most likely the millennium i have to look up more stuff about it i'm sure a lot of scholars out there know more than i do but the lord is the one who instructs me and i'm always listen to him and about eight years or nine years ago it was around this time of the year and i heard these trumpets like in the heavenlies i was hearing trumpets and i was like wow like what are these trumpets? And it was around the same time I met someone from Israel who God had told me to really listen to. And actually a lot of people from Israel started coming to my life. And what he was wanting me to understand was that we are at the Feast of Trumpets right now, or at the Feast of Tabernacles, which will always be celebrated. And when the, we're in the millennium, they're going to be celebrated. We're going to go to Jerusalem once a year. And it says in Zechariah 14, 16, 19, that it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all nations, which came up against Jerusalem, shall go out, up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the Feast of the Trumpets, which is um, what's happening right now. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, on them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. There shall be the judgment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So, there's a lot of other scriptures in the Bible about the feast, like the Feast of Purim in the book of Esther. It's not one of the main ones, but it's, it's fantastic. And it says, celebrate this feast every year, like to honor the Lord. It talks about it at the end of the book of Esther. And it never says not to celebrate it. And this isn't a legalistic way of looking at the Bible. Maybe you could get legalistic in the way you celebrate the feast. I'm not sure. I'm sure there's always a way you can get legalistic. This is like foundational. This is like drawing on the roots of our faith, drawing on the water that comes from God so we can be a strong tree and have strong branches and bear good fruit. And God honors his feasts. I am very simple-minded and very like, like a child in a lot of ways, but I, I said... I wanted to do this. You know, I was really astounded when it really 
hit home to me that we had broken off those roots and I wanted to be back in the fold. I wanted my grafted in branch to be really, really, really strong. So I said, I'm going to celebrate Passover. And <clears throat> Passover, uh, I had never celebrated Passover. I thought, well, I'll do it with my children. We'll just have Passover together. And I'm not sure how we'll do it. I'm just going to do it. I just made a decision to celebrate Passover. Then a friend I had met from Jerusalem called me up. She said, my daughter and I are going to be in your area for Passover. And I said, oh, I'm going to have a Passover. And she said, I want to come to your Passover. Okay, so here's my first non-believing Jewish person and her daughter coming from Jerusalem to my Passover. I'm like, wow, that's an honor. That's really an honor. Well, the word started spreading. I was having a Passover. So I had non-believing Jewish people wanting to come to my Passover. I had believing Jewish people wanting to come to my Passover. And I had believers in the Lord wanting to come to my Passover. <laughs> and there began to get, be a little bit of dissension. Um, the believers, they said, we're well, going to show them, right? Jesus in the Passover. I mean, you're going to show these Jews Jesus in the Passover. And the Jewish people that were coming that were non-believers, I'm sure they were absolutely terrified because they know I'm a believer. They're probably like, what is she going to do? But they wanted to come. They were drawn to come. The Jewish believers, um, I don't know, didn't get that much input from them now when I think about it. But I decided just to pray about it. I'm just going to celebrate the Passover, how God wants me to celebrate the Passover. So what I ended up doing was just reading the word where it talks about the Passover. And I tried to implement the things that are said in the word. And about 25 people came. And I then I... I read the Old Testament, we implemented the things that it said in the Old Testament, and then we had our dinner, and then we talked about the Last Supper, and I read about the Last Supper, which was a Passover, and I presented what Jesus said at that Passover in a very humble way, and then we sang songs, we mostly sang songs, and we sang a few songs about Jesus, and I tried to make a bridge by singing some Hebrew, I tried to wash the feet. What I said to the believers coming was we have this 1700 year gap in the church that we, we need to restore the breach. So when these Jewish non-believers come, let's wash the feet. Let's serve them. Let's, let's see how we can serve them. So and we did. People were very humble and very sweet and uh, it, the Lord showed up. It was very beautiful. And Afterwards, the woman from Jerusalem, she said, this was the best Passover I've ever went to. And I was so happy because how can you celebrate Passover without looking at the Tanakh and without looking at the New Testament? How can you do it? You can't do it one way or the other. You can't just present Jesus in the Passover without the depth of what it really means when they spread the blood over the doors and how the lamb was significant. And, and of course, people do that when they celebrate Jesus in the Passover. I'm not saying that they don't. It's just I couldn't come in that way to these non-believers. It seemed almost arrogant to me. I had to come in a really humble, meek way and make that bridge. It seems that we have to have a lot of humility if we've had so much pride in the church. So that's just for your information. And I'll share more about the feast. I've had such incredible experiences as I just set my mind to do that and celebrate the feast of the Lord. Um, but what I'm saying is the Lord honors his feast. He honors his days. And I, I don't know if you guys see it, but I feel like, um, I mean, I love Christmas. I love Christmas time. I always have. And, and in my heart, I, I want to celebrate that Jesus was born. It's his birthday. But really, most likely, he was born around now, the Feast of Sukkot. And they, when they had the census, they went up. Um, so more about that later. But uh, I don't know if you kind of see it in our culture. It seems to get more and more and more commercial 
and it, it's because it's just over that time's over so we really have to pray and think about what we're going to do and how we're going to teach our families so anyway there began to be these other leaders in the church um origin or oregon i think it's origin o-r-i-g-e-n um he rose up as a pretty strong teacher and leader of the allegorical message for reading the Bible. And he accused the Jews of killing the Christians. Um, Eusebius rose up. He also declared that the church now was the true Israel of God. Um, Jerome, uh, Chrysostom, Chrysostom. <laughs> I, I, I somehow, I had an aversion to all these people, and I know that people in schools of theology study these people, and they're very, think that they're very devout, and they're very much get into their teachings, but I personally, even as a new believer, had a lot of aversion in my spirit to the schools of theology that were out in the Christian church. I I just couldn't get into it. I was like, this doesn't seem right, you know? And but it's because I listen to the Lord and the Lord talks to me and I he's my shepherd. He's the one that has the voice that I listen to and I follow him. So it when something is right, it, it seems right in my spirit and I start to see fruit coming from it. And so anyway, um now Chris Chrysostom <laughs> Um, he said that the synagogue is worse than a brothel. It is a den of scoundrels, the temple of demons devoted to idol idolatrous cults, a meeting place for the assassins of Christ, a den of thieves, a house of ill fame, a refuge of devils, and a gulf and abyss of perdition. For me, I hate the synagogue and I hate the Jews for the same reason. Ugh, this is some of the roots of anti-Semitism that came in the Christian church. Um, so what I'm saying is it didn't happen overnight. There were many, many um, influences that came in to cut us off from the Jewish roots of our faith, which allowed then Satan to come in in the name of God and kill the Jewish people. So we really, this is grievous, guys, grievous, grievous. I don't know, when it really hit home to me, I, I saw blood on my hands. And now I probably am at the lineage of true believers that were killed and were chased and had to be in hiding because I have a really strong lineage of the Lord. But nevertheless, I'm sure I have many family members and ancestors who have been in the church. And in the name of God, in the church, we have killed God's people, slaughtered them. It's grievous. And we ought to weep about it. I mean, when I really felt it hit home to me, I wept for months, <laughs> actually. So, and then I made... A way to make a bridge. I said, I want to be a bridge. So I started learning about things that could make the bridge and restore it, restore the bridge. That's in Isaiah 58. So, I mean, that's great that we have the, you know, Isaiah 58 talks about the true fast. And, you know, there's a lot of fasting in the Christian church. And I'm so happy people are out there fasting. And but it's, it's really the true fast is what the Lord is concerned about. And that's undoing the bonds of the prisoners and it's restoring the breach. It talks about in there. I mean, really, if you spent 40 days really pressing in and understanding about the Feast of Israel, I think that that would be significant of a true fast. Not that you shouldn't fast, but I'm really getting the sense that we need the true fast in Isaiah 58. So... And I have fasted on many occasions. I'm not saying not to fast. <laughs> so anyway, um, the literal interpretation of the scripture then was thrown out. And also, you know, the Bible was canonized at the Council of Nicaea. So 
There were some writings of apostles that you can find in the lost books of the Bible um, that talk more about Israel, and you read them for yourself. You know, you see if the Spirit of God speaks to you or not. It's a they they really gleaned gleaned it out so that it would not be as much about Israel, um, especially the New Testament. Now, when's the last time you read the Bible literally? And every single time you read Israel, you thought of Israel, the nation of Israel first, then thought of yourself as sharing in the blessings of Israel. Yeah, try that. See how many times you read Israel and think of it literally. So, um... The writings of the allegorical, I mean, the, the allegorical method was really accepted. And Augustine came in, um, also was a really strong spokesman for God um, around 354. But he really wrote that the millennium kingdom was now and that we're in this kingdom. So out of those roots became things like you know, dominion now and kingdom now and replacement theology. Um, that is part of that too. So <clears throat> there was also a lot of, you know, the enemy just really wanted to get into the church, okay? He wanted to sit as close to the cross as he could get so he could destroy the Jews. Because God's plan for the Jewish people has never, ever changed. And he will come back on the Mount of Olives where all the Orthodox Jews, see the Orthodox Jewish people really believe that their Messiah is coming. And they believe that he's coming on the Mount of Olives. Now, the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem is like a really cool place. It's completely covered with graves of Orthodox Jews who want to be the first to see their Messiah and have their bones be raised and they're going to be raised out of their graves. They literally believe that he's coming, but they think it's the first coming. Now, we as believers believe that he's coming again to the Mount of Olives, and he really will raise the people up. And I don't know the timing of it all. I've got to research that a little bit more. But we are in those times because Jesus said if the time of the Gentiles is over in 1967 and that's the time that he raises the Jewish people takes the blindness off their eyes and we have some kind of generation between that time when the nation of Israel was established to where Jesus comes back there's a lot of argument over how many years is a generation I don't know I have to press in more and and really hear the Lord on what he would like me to say. But we got ripped off by our calendar because we are we have a sun god calendar, and so we're in the year um, 2008 after Christ, right? But the, the Jewish, the acceptable Jewish calendar, we're in the year 5,769, I think, but it's not particularly accurate. So... Um, I got to research more of that. But if you think of that, the Lord says a day is a thousand years in a sight, and a thousand years is a day. Okay, He created the earth in six days, the heavens and the earth in six days, and on the seventh day He rested. Well, many people believe, and I believe too, it's the symbol of the times that we have that one day is a thousand years, and when the 6,000 years is up, which we're almost to that, even if you estimate that we would have about 200 years, but I don't think that's it at all. I think we have much less than that based on the generation of it's going to come before the generation is a generation passes from when the fig tree came to fruition, which is when Israel became a nation again in 1948, then we have this generation that the Lord is going to come back. So, but even if you think of it in that, in the light of 5,769, it's like we, we're almost done with the 6,000 years 
which is the time of the work, and then we get the rest, which is the seventh millennium, the seventh day. It's the seven thousand years. It's the seventh day of seven thousand years. I don't know if that makes sense. It makes sense to me. <laughs> I'll try to. I'll try to describe it better. Um, but. That millennium is a literal millennium where there really is a restored heaven and earth. We really go up to Jerusalem. The line is lays down with the lamb and we're not in that millennium. Okay. If you think we're in that millennium and you think that Satan's already bound up, you're probably in la la land because, um, I really am persecuted by Satan and the demonic spirits night and day. Um, so anyway, there became a lot of anti-Semitism in the church. That's what I'm trying to say. And when God, um, when the Council of Nicaea actually took place, which I'll just skip ahead here in my little book. Um, so the church fathers, which are the people I just spoke of, I mean, basically, driving out the Lord's words for Israel. Just saying, no, they're not true anymore. God hates them. We hate them. Um, basically, he would have been saying, they would be saying to the Lord and his apostles, we don't want you anymore. But it was so deceptive. You can see I was really deceptive. So I'm sure in any modern day school of theology, it's just a den of thieves. I mean, how could it not be unless they're understanding the Feast of Israel, the roots of our faith, and understanding literal Israel. And you have a chance. Every day you have a chance to get it, get it right. And if you get it right, and then you go back into the sun god worshiping church, you have a chance to get it right again. Um, keep getting it right. Get, get it right. Get it right. I, I really feel that from the Lord. Um, there have been popes in the recent years trying to restore the Catholic Church to the calendar of the harvest and the moon, restore them to Israel. They are persecuted against violently. But God will judge the, the pagan sun god worshiping church. He will judge the Gentile church if we don't get it. And perhaps he allowed that up until 1967. He allowed that deception. They possibly was a judgment against the Jews. He, God does those things. Um, he will also judge us. He's not going to leave anything unjudged, and he's not going to leave anything unforgiven, though, if we call on his name. Okay, so... When this council happened, there was those set up events, and the Constantine came and unified the Roman Empire and converted it into the Christian religion. So it became like a religion of the government, of the state, of like we're setting this religion up. And they decided that, and this happened in 325 AD. And this council decided that they would celebrate the resurrection of Jesus on the Sunday following the first full moon after the ver vernal equinox rather than the biblical date. So Easter Sunday is, they decided now that Jesus rose on Easter Sunday, which was not the date that he rose on. He rose on, he died on the Passover, then they have the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, and then he rose again on the Feast of the First Fruit. It's, um, there's a first harvest and a first fruit, and I'll go into that more later when I study it a little bit more. As you can see, I'm not that, like, I'm not a scholar, I just am a believer who really wants to follow the Lord. So I present this to you in a very um, childlike way, because the Lord delivers these things into babes. And then I have a responsibility to share that with you. So, so basically Easter, which was the spring festival when the pagans worshipped Ishtar, 
I-S-H-T-A-R, they worshipped the god or goddess Ishtar. They decided Jesus now is rising on this day at this time, and it really isn't then about Jesus, a Jewish person who died on Passover and rose again the third day. It became a very pagan celebration. That's where you get the Easter egg, all this stuff. I think it was the goddess of fertility, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. She got all the Easter egg. So they also changed the date of his crucifixion to Good Friday. Um, so it's very confusing if you're trying to share it with a Jewish person or a person from the Middle East, or even a person that has any kind of scholarly mind at all, why are you celebrating Jesus dying on Good Friday? Like, what is it about? Um, it is a chosen day to celebrate that, and many people celebrate out of the goodness of their heart, and you know, that's just great, but that's not the day the Lord died. And they, it really is in the Jewish calendar that Passover comes. And the Lord honors his days. He honors his days and he honors his time. And um, now that's an estimated calendar, but still, it's a, we got to get as close as we can get, don't we? We really got to get as close as we can get. Like, we... We don't want to go over here anymore because now we know it's wrong. We know it's not the day the Lord rose. We know it's not the day he died on Good Friday. He, he, he died on Passover. He rose again on the, the day of the first fruit. That's when he, he rose out of the grave. It's like, let's get that right. Let's try to get it as right as we can because we will feel the Lord. Like The Lord honors his his feast he honors his time and i personally i can't go anymore i can't go to church on easter it's just i can't i can't i love i loved easter as a kid but i want to worship the lord and know him as who he is i really want to know him as who he is and not what some council told me he should be or whatever so the Romans worshipped many gods, and their high god was the sun. Um, more about that later. <laughs> but the great winter festival was celebrated on December 25th, which the pagans considered to be the birthday of the sun. Okay, so this is where I'm talking about the sun god worshipping church. It's like I'm calling you out of that God is calling you out of that Jesus did not was not born on December 25th and if you want to celebrate the day of his birth every day of the year I mean that's wonderful you know and if you want to remember the Lord on the 25th you can remember him but don't leave off that he was most likely not born actually was not born that day but most likely born during this time wouldn't you rather celebrate that day of the Lord? I would. I really love it. But if you want to love your family, I mean, you have to decide what to do because it's so paganized um, and it's so commercial. It's really in our face, you know, and our kids, it, it's hard. So um, the, uh, they, call, they also changed, <laughs> God, Okay, we're supposed to rest on Shabbat. Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat is Saturday. It's from sundown Friday night to Saturday night at sundown, and that was the day of rest. Now, the word in Hebrew for rest is so strong that it's not really like rest. It's like strike. Like you're supposed to go on strike, like no work, like rest, okay? Well, I'm not legalistic about that. I'm not going to be legalistic about that. But I do know the Lord wants us to rest and he wants us to have a time to worship him that we really set aside for him. So that has to be out of your heart. I'm not presenting a legalistic way to do that. But we have to realize that they changed the days at the same time that they changed 
they changed the days of the week. So they worshipped the sun god on Sunday. So they decided, hey, we'll just worship Jesus on Sunday. So they decided that would be the special day of worship. They decided to adopt their calendar, which revolves around the sun and, and the sun god instead of the moon. Um, in just a second, I'll get to that. But the, the days of the week, they go on. I mean, it's not just Sunday. It's Monday was their, the day they worshipped the moon goddess um, and a host of other ancient gods. Two is a god they worshipped for Tuesday, Wooden was Wednesday, Thor Thursday, Frigg Friday, and Saturn Saturday. They just decided, hey, let's let's take these other days of the week. And we want to do that. And that became our weeks, you know? It's like, I'm sorry, it's confusing. <laughs> but um it became very anti-Semitic. Um at this council, they required Jews who had accepted Jesus as their Messiah. They required them to say this denouncement. Um, they had to say, I renounce all customs, rites, legalisms, unleavened breads, and sacrifices of lambs of the Hebrews, and all other feasts of the Hebrews, sacrifices, prayers, aspirations, purifications, sanctifications, and propitiations, and fasts, and new moons, we're supposed to follow the moon calendar, and Sabbaths, we're supposed to rest on the Sabbath, Shabbat, Saturday, and superstitions, and hymns, and chants, and observances in synagogues, and the food and drink of the Hebrews. In one word, I renounce everything Jewish, every law, right, and custom, and if afterwards I shall wish to deny and return to Jewish superstition, or shall be found eating with Jews, or feasting with them, or secretly conversing and condemning the Christian religion instead of openly confusing them and condemning their vain faith, then let the trembling of Cain and the leprosy of Gehazi cleave to me, as well as legal punishments to which I acknowledge myself liable. You know, Revelation, where it says, you know, I have this against you because you allowed, you commanded them to eat foods that were sacrificed to idols. Um, they, you know, the Jews really believe that you don't eat pork. I mean, it's, it had a cloven foot. There's a whole thing, you know, in the Old Testament about it being unclean. And they really sat down and made the Jewish believers eat pork. I mean, they made them eat it. And, you know, you should do what's in your heart to do. You need to uh, be all things to all men on some points, but on other points you need to, like, not eat pork if you're with some, some believers or some Jewish people that don't eat pork. Don't offend people and don't certainly don't make them eat your food. I mean, I, I have a whole thing. I'd like to go on and on that for like an hour. But um, the institutional church emerged and the Roman state church considered itself to be, to be the kingdom of God. <sighs> So, the new church was flooded with pagans. Uh, it was not necessarily people who were believing in Jesus. I mean, I don't know how much Jesus could get in there. I'm surprised he's even been able to get in at all. I mean, really. Because at that point, they were saying, okay, Jesus, you're out. Apostles, you're out. Um, let's see, all the foundational members who've been martyred for the faith, you guys are out. Um it's like, it was so, so, so Oops. And I want to be with the Lord. Um, I have a zealous, uh, that scripture in the Psalms, and it, where it says, the zeal of my house has eaten me up. It's where Jesus takes that whip, and he goes into the temple, and where they had made it a den of thieves, 
And he takes that and he cleans out the temple and he quotes that scriptures because the zeal of his house, of his father's house, had eaten him up. Well, I have to say that the zeal of God's house has eaten me up. It has consumed my life. And I have given everything to build his house, his house, his spiritual house where true believers can dwell and fellowship and it is not a building and it is not about money and it is not about um the pagan religions that entered the church i don't need to go on about that but this allowed then the separation of the Jewish roots of our faith and now understanding them, but this was 1700 years. So it got really dark, really, really dark. Like when the Black Death hit Europe, the, the Jewish community had better hygiene in general than the other communities. And so they didn't have the high number of deaths during the Black Death, it was not as high as the other people. So, of course, the Christians and other people said, well, the Jews must be causing the Black Death, so they persecuted them and killed them even more. Um, during the Crusades, started out to be a vengeance to take Jerusalem back from the Muslims that were coming in, but it turned out to be also killing a high number of Jewish people on the way. So if you have a Christian crusade, Jewish people are probably not going to show up. So maybe you could call it something different. Um, so many people have died in the name of God with the cross, which were God's people. And I feel like one of my roles in my life is to repair the breach and restore the breach and I'm, and I'm an ambassador for the Lord. Now, this isn't just the Jewish people. I mean, I've done a lot of work with the First Nation people in America um, who were literally killed like, like a cross, like driven into their heart, you know, I'm killing you in the name of the Lord. I mean, the horrible things that have been done in the name of the Lord, it's like, it's so... It's so horrible, and if you don't feel that, and you don't weep about that, and you don't do something about that, I don't know if you know him. I really don't know. I mean, if you're just sitting around going, bless me, bless me, I don't know who you are. And, you know, I hope God does. I don't know who you are. I I, I've, I hear the, the calls of people who have been martyred in the name of the Lord, the victims of the Holocaust, the victims at Wounded Knee in America, and different massacres that happened. Um, anytime a person is killed in the name of God, uh, unwrongly, it really grieves me. Now, are there wars, and in the wars in the Bible, it's full of wars. Yeah. I mean, there's times you have to go in, right? I mean, what if we wouldn't have went in in World War II, what if we wouldn't have went in, then we the the Jewish nation would have been wiped out, and you know Hitler would be re reigning over the whole world. So I believe there's a, there are times we have to. Um, I hope that you know I don't have to go. I hope my sons don't have to go. But that is always going to be there. So I don't want to harp about that, but. The Crusades, allowing the anti-Semitism that came into the church, it just was so dark that the Crusades could actually happen. When they were killing these Jewish people in the Crusades, they these people with crosses in the name of the Lord, they surrounded the synagogues. And as they burned the synagogues and had... They sang, Christ, we adore thee, as they set fire to the synagogue and came with the banner. They said, we've done this all in the banner of the Lord. I mean, this is like, 
you know, you got to really get some history on this. So the Inquisition came um, about the time Columbus was discovering America. And I read more about Columbus, I'll have more on that later, but um, literally people were tortured and killed who were true believers and Jews. So the battle continues to go on, and it's against the true believers and it's against the Jews. Now, one reason God blesses America, even though we're so sinful and we have sent messages of sin to the world, and we're so full of greed and pride and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I wrote a whole book on that. You can see it on my website at mysticcenter.com. It's called The Walking Dead. It's about information for our nation. Um, but one reason God preserves us is because we bless Israel. And in Genesis, it says, those who bless you, I will bless. And it, really, it is talking about literal Israel. It's talking about literal Israel. And when the Durban conferences happened in 2001, when they, they were trying to say that Zionism is racism, which is what the Antichrist is going to be all about. Basically, it's going to be like, you can't believe there's one way or we have to get you out of the way because you're standing in the way of world peace. Um, so they're trying to say Zionism is racism. Well, Israel walked out and also America walked out with Israel and that was the only two countries. There are other nations that do stand by Israel and have stood by Israel, but America is consistently stood by Israel. If we chose not to stand by Israel, we are in great danger because one of the reasons God preserves and blesses us is that we do stand with Israel. Am I pro-Israel? Am I? No. God is. God is. Okay. Um, am I anti-everyone else? No. I love every all peoples and God loves all peoples. And he wants all people to come into his Messiah, and he created the Messiah. He said he came to his own, they received him not, and then he gave his life for the offering of the world. He gave it for everyone. Now, even Orthodox Jewish people and who are really looking for their Messiah, they believe that Messiah will come, and he's going to bless all the nations. I mean, they believe that. They don't believe it was just for them. They understand that truth. Um, so this is like really imperative, though, that we line ourselves up with God because it's going to get worse. Anti-Semitism is going to get worse. Um, there is going to be more turmoil and you know, when they say, peace, peace, it's a time of destruction, so look up for your redemption draws nigh. Uh, the peace sign, you know, came out in 1967 or somewhere around there. I mean, I'm sure that was a setup of the enemy somehow to twist our minds. I love the peace symbol. I think it's cool. I like to wear it and everything. But, but really, when you think about it, it's like there isn't any peace, and, and it's going to get more more it's going to get worse for the dividing lines are going to get worse you either are embracing all religions and all ways and it's all ways or you're going this one narrow path into your messiah and aligning yourself with literal israel and a literal messiah who came as a jewish person now god is so powerful He's so astounding. <laughs> I heard a testimony of a man who just was incredibly powerful. And this is just to show you a little tidbit of how powerful our Lord is and how much he loves people. This was a Palestinian man, and he was an ex-Fatah leader. He led Fatah in Palestine for a number of years. He defected, he came to America, he had a family, had a restaurant, and I got to hear his testimony. It was really powerful. 
he was searching in his heart and it, he had been in this country for maybe 20 years and um a man would come into his restaurant and this man probably prayed for him i'm not sure but this is the man who ultimately led him to the lord but the Fatah leader, the ex-Fatah leader, eventually sat down with the man and they started having conversations. And then he's, he finally said to him, I, the ex-Fatah leader said to the believing man, he said, I feel lost. I feel like I need something. And the, the believing man, he said, well, you come to my house tonight and you're going to have to meet a Jew. And so... He did. He came to his house that night, and what the believing man was introducing him to was Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah. I mean, that's what he did. He basically opened the book of John, and he started to read the first words in the book of John, which I should have had out so I could read them. Um, but... And then he was talking about the word made flesh, and he was in that whole first chapter. And the man just like fell on his face and started shaking and started speaking in tongues and got radically, radically saved. And it was like just the power of the word of God. But it turns out later, his son had gotten saved a few weeks before and was scared to tell his father who would probably want to kill him, right? So he had a church of like 8,000 people praying for this man. So he, there was all this prayer, all this power. The word of God goes out, and the man is completely saved. Now, he's an incredibly beautiful man, and he goes around um, and tries to restore the breach between Ishmael and Isaac. As, um, Isaac, Isaac and Ishmael, Isaac and Ishmael. Um, he, there, I heard him talking alongside an Israeli soldier who had also gotten saved, and they had an incredible talk together. So it's one on one on one on one on one on one on one. You restore the breach, you make amends, people come to know the Lord, and you're building this kingdom that is not of this earth, that will go on forever. This earth will pass away, the Lord says, um, but his word will never pass away. And then there's a restored earth, I guess, I don't know, maybe a thousand years, and there's New Jerusalem. So there's a lot of stuff to, to talk about, but I just want to wanted to give that overview. Um, also, these apostasies in the church led to the Holocaust actually being able to happen where Christians believe they were doing God's service to kill the Jews. Now, true believers, no way, no way, no way, no way. They hid the Jews. They went and died with the Jews, the Jewish people. Um, true believers were persecuted at the same time of the Holocaust. But the church as a state, the pagan Christian church, killed and slaughtered Jews in the name of God. They even would hang the swastika up in the synagogue, I mean in the church, instead of the cross. And Lutheranism is strong in Germany because Luther rose up there. And Luther himself, I love Martin Luther. I think he was incredibly zealous for God. I can't wait to meet him in heaven. He really, really tried to restore the breach with the Jews, and he made a bomb with the Jews, but he must have got hardened somewhere along the way, and he ended up turning against the Jews violently in his writings. Um, I mean, this is how bad it got, Martin Luther uh, got in his writings. He said that... Um, he said that we are at fault if we don't slay them or for not slaying them because he felt that they were evil. And this had to have been the enemy, the deception that came into his head at some point. And, and of course, Hitler would quote Martin Luther's words as he led his nation and other nations to actually slaughter the Jews. Now, 
this could have been that God knew that he was just about ready to create Zion, to create Israel, and, and the enemy decided, I'm going to try to kill them all first. Because the enemy knows that once Israel is a state again, which it is a nation, that it was very close time for the Lord to come back. So, you know, or was it just the Lord's plan? I mean, there obviously it was all the Lord's plan. But he uses, he sets up kingdoms and takes them down for his purposes. He uses, like the Assyrian came in as a judgment for the nation of Israel when they were saying against God. And, you know, all of us have done this thing where we go and get the pagan. I mean, that's what Israel did all along the way. Like at Canaan, they adopted, like, what, astrology and stuff, which is now really heavy in the Hasidic Jewish, I think. Um, I can't be wrong on these things, so please, like, don't, you know, stone me. <laughs> but um, the uh, same with the Kabbalah, there's, like, a lot of pagan rituals, rites, doctrines that got into those teachings. And so we as the Gentile believing church, okay, we adopted some pagan things. And anytime you do that, it's going to bring destruction and deception and all kinds of evil workings. So more on that later. There's different speculation. I mean, I love to go hear like two people talking like, oh, I heard two people talking from Israel, two Jewish spokesmen from Israel who very much love God. And they were absolutely in disagreement completely. And they're both like, whatever God wills. I mean, the, you know, nobody really, nobody really knows what's going on. Ultimately, we just have, we have pictures, we have a plan, we have a timeline, we, we prophesy in part, we know in part, and we keep humble before God. So we don't miss them. We, we don't, don't want to miss them. They didn't recognize their own Messiah. The non-believing Jewish people didn't recognize their own Messiah because they were prideful and they wanted him to come, you know, and set up the Roman, get, I mean, take down the Roman Empire and set up his kingdom and all that stuff. And the believing Jewish people were people who were most likely really humble of heart. And so they were able to see God. Now, I just fear God not recognizing God. It, it's a scary thing to think. And it happens all the time. It happens. I really believe that. God presents himself and even comes into churches, you know, like his spirit tries to come in. He sends prophets in. He sends teachers. He sends people of God in. And they're, they're cast out because people don't recognize that it's God showing up or God working through people. So um, we'll talk more on that later, that those souls in Revelation, it says, are crying out, like, when will you avenge our death? When we avenge our death, these were the souls that were slain that were godly people. These were people of God that got killed. 